Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Beverly Vaughan, the director of the UK Spine, and I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome you here today to our virtual seminar. As everybody arrives into our virtual uh, session, can I please just ask you all to turn your camera off and mute your microphone during the presentations. And any questions that you have, please do feel free to post them into our chat box and we will be picking up on those at the end of our presentations this afternoon for our Q&A session where we're very much looking forward to getting a really lively conversation going. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Janet Lord, who will be chairing today's uh, session of panellists um, and will also introduce everybody. So uh, Professor Janet Lord, over to you. Thank you, Bev. So welcome everybody to this session from bench to care home in a time of COVID. What the three speakers are going to try and get a discussion going with is introducing some concepts, beginning with some basic concepts around drivers of ageing from Professor Lynn Cox uh, from the University of Oxford. We will then uh, have myself, I'll cover some aspects of what happens to your immune system with old age and what, how that might affect your response to um, coronavirus. And then we'll finish with Dr Joan Manick, um, who's the Chief Medical Officer of Restore Bio, uh, and has actually um, developed drugs to actually improve the immune system of older adults. So um, I hope, as you say, we'll have a, a good discussion going at the end. Each speaker will speak for approximately 15 minutes and we'll take questions at the end rather than after each session. So I'll first of all welcome Professor Lynn Cox uh, from Oxford, who will uh, introduce us to um, cell senescence. OK, thanks very much, Janet. And hello, everybody. It's lovely to be with you today. Um, just going to see if I can share this. OK, hopefully you can see my PowerPoint now. So, uh, as Janet said, um, the three of us together are going to try and cover from bench to care home in a time of COVID. Um, I'm a basic lab scientist. I'm based at the Department of Biochemistry in Oxford. And um, what I'm going to try and do is, is provide a baseline of understanding of the science of ageing and then hand over the baton to Janet so she could dis discuss immune ageing and then uh, to Joan so uh, she can talk about translating those findings into the clinic. And we believe that ageing science is particularly relevant, not just at any point, but particularly in a time of this pandemic. So let's look first at the problems that older people encounter. Um, oh, and here we have <laughs> a problem, right. OK, so um, older people, as we all know, just anecdotally suffer from a range of different diseases. So cancer, heart disease, dementia, um, loss of vision, osteoporosis, um, sarcopenia, incontinence. And it's not just one disease. They tend to suffer many different diseases all at once. So this is termed multimorbidity. And you can see that by the age of 85, almost everybody has at least one long term condition, some as many as eight or more. So as we age, the risk of multimorbidity grows up, uh, goes up. And this has major implications um, for older people and particularly now. So not only these chronic diseases, but also infectious diseases. Um, older people are particularly susceptible to infection. And we've seen this no more clearly than uh, with COVID. So this is up to date data from ONS showing um, that people under 65 have relatively low death rates from COVID. But this goes up really massively as we get into the very old and frail populations who are suffering from multimorbidity. Right, try and find the buttons. OK, now this has major cost implications. It has implications for people who suffer from multimorbidity in their families and also in terms of health and social care systems. So it's a problem that we need to tackle and we need to tackle it with some urgency. But how do we go about doing this? And one way of thinking about it is instead of thinking of all these things as different independent diseases, is to look and see that they all associate very strongly with age. So can we treat the under uh, the diseases of aging by looking at underlying biological processes? And my lab is particularly interested in something called cell senescence or cell aging. So what do we mean by cell senescence? Well, we all start off with young cells, happy, healthy cells. They have specialized functions. Mm -hmm. Their DNA is fine. 
Um, but as those cells undergo multiple rounds of cell division, so as we grow and as we repair our tissues, we encounter damage. So our cells are exposed to DNA damaging agents, um, genes that get switched on that shouldn't. And even the process of making energy using oxygen is dangerous to our cells. It can create oxidative stress. And as we all know that um, high sugar is, is dangerous, particularly in diabetes. And this is because um, you can get changes to lipids, um, so the fats of our bodies and proteins, through a chemical reaction called glycation, which can drive cell senescence. So we end up with cells that essentially are morphologically, so size and shape, they're very different. Functionally, they've lost their specialized activity. They show a lot of DNA damage. But more than that, they acquire a number of quite damaging characteristics and these include um, the ability to secrete now a whole pile of factors that are pro-inflammatory um, chemokines cytokines and um, enzymes that actually break down the, the structures of your tissues so um, i'm particularly noticing it um, around the corners of the eyes and i'm sure with time it'll get even worse but that's breakdown of tissues because of the things that senescent cells are churning out all the time and we know that senescent cells alter their gene expression and their function and um, some genes that should be regulated i.e there's a tap that you can turn on or off seems like the tap is stuck into the permanently on position so this is called hyperfunction Senescent cells also clog up with a pile of junk because they fail un un to undergo recycling, a uh, process known as autophagy. And they also don't have the good grace to die, so they sit around not undergoing programmed cell death called apoptosis. So colloquially, senescent cells are, are called zombie cells, and like zombies, they can impact on the surrounding cells, so they can make cells around them become senescent too. And all of these features together cause not just local effects, so not just around the senescent cells, but across the whole body. So um, it leads to a state of chronic inflammation, tissue damage, and these cells can create an environment that is favorable for the growth of cancer cells. All of these changes obviously contribute to the multimorbidity of older age. And this has been shown very clearly experimentally where injecting senescent cells into just one part of a mouse leads that poor mouse, a young mouse, to develop multiple different diseases of aging across the whole body. And then we mustn't forget that the immune system also can undergo senescence, known as immunosenescence. And obviously Janet will cover this in a lot more detail, but I just wanted to point out that there are essentially three pillars to the immune system. The first is which the epithelial barrier, so that's the wall between us and the outside world, so your skin, or the lining of the lungs or, or the GI tract. And essentially, it's a wall holding out the barbarian invaders. And if that wall is breached, we also need troops to come to the rescue. And the immediate response is through something called the innate immune system. So Janet will cover this in much more detail. Um, it's a very immediate and quick response, but not very specialized. And then we move on to the adaptive immune system uh, of B cells and T cells. The problem with aging is that all of these pillars can start to uh, lose function. So barriers become weakened by potentially through cell senescence. Um, the innate immune cells that are normally pretty good at recognizing pathogens may lose that, that recognition ability and they may actually cause excess inflammation. And then the adaptive immune system can also undergo senescence. Um, and sometimes even fail to be able to tell the difference between us and them. And so older people have a much higher risk of diseases of autoimmunity where the body attacks itself. So senescent cells are, are pretty bad for us. There's a lot of evidence suggesting that they're bad for us. So if we get rid of them, is that going to be good? And um, there, there's a vast body of literature now. Uh, from multiple labs around the world showing that that really is the case, that killing senescent cells improves health in aging mice. So one example um, from uh, Darren Baker and Jan van Dersen looks at prematurely aging mice. These are litimates. This is what happens to a mouse as it gets old. It gets hunchback called kyphosis. If you remove senescent cells from a mouse, it doesn't develop the kyphosis or very much lower incidence and is much healthier. 
Now this is in a premature aging model, so what about normal aging? And it turns out it's exactly the same thing. So this is normal aging in mice. They're a bit sad, they're losing their fur, they've got hunchback. Um, and these are their litter mates that have been fed a drug that kills senescent cells. And remarkably, that also extends their lifespan very, very markedly. But you could argue that these are different mice, although they're supposed to be genetically identical, they may be different. So Peter de Keyser has um, treated mice, individual mice with a drug and monitored them before the treatment where they're very sick, they're very old, their fur's coming away, they're graying, and they're pretty sad actually, they don't run around or do much. And shortly after treatment with a drug that removes senescent cells, Peter's shown that the fur regrows, these mice are happier, they're healthier. And if you look, it's essentially across the board. So removal of senescent cells improves multiple different organs, um, tissues and organ systems, and importantly, even behavior. So this poor sad mouse that just sat in a corner being miserable, starts running around and being inquisitive and behaving like a young animal again. So we know that in mice, killing senescent cells is good. What about people? Well, because these is so exciting and compelling, the preclinical data, there are a large number of clinical trials ongoing at the moment. Unfortunately, uh, a trial of osteoarthritis of the knee by Unity Biotech has now been pulled, um, showing not the efficacy that they'd hoped for, but there are a number of trials going on now with multiple different indications of diseases associated with aging or even syndromes, complex syndromes like frailty. Um, now, at the beginning of January last year, um, a keynote paper came out. So this is the first in man published study of the effect of drugs that kill senescent cells in people. And it was in an intractable human disease, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, very poor prognosis for these people. And it's, it's um, caused by a large number of senescent cells. And upon very short term treatment, uh, these patients showed physiological improvements so they could walk for further, they could walk faster, and they could get up and down out of the chair much more easily. And although it was a tiny study, so there wasn't statistical significance, there were trends to show that senescence markers were starting to decrease. So um, there's evidence from preclinical trials, uh, preclinical studies and human clinical trials now that senolytics are beneficial, but there are many, many different approaches to um, dealing with the problems caused by senescent cells. One of them is simply to suppress the damaging factors that um, senescent cells kick out, the so-called senescence-associated secretory phenotype. So we might be able to suppress that inflammation and harm. Another way of doing it might be oops, um, to modify the way senescent cells function. So either um, delay the onset of cell senescence or even possibly take a very old sick cell and modify it to reverse the process so it's less damaging to the person. So um, in order to do this, though, we have to understand biochemically the difference between a, a young cell and an old cell. And how do we do this? Well, my lab's been um, growing human cells in culture for a very, very long time now, doing long-term longitudinal studies, taking young cells, growing them from multiple cell divisions in the lab until they're very old, and then essentially playing a game of molecular spot the difference, where we compare cells of different ages and look at all the proteins that they possess through a process called proteomics. And to cut a long story short, we can identify key biochemical pathways which change with aging. And one that stood out for us was um, a pathway called mTOR signaling. Um, and it's this component mTOR that appears to be permanently switched on in senescent cells. Uh, so it's that tap, that hyperfunction that should be regulated, but it's left on. And of course, we all know what happens if you leave a tap turned on you flood the bathroom and it's not good for anybody. So what can we do about it? Well, what we've been trying to do is use drugs called mTOR inhibitors to overcome this mTOR hyperactivity that leads to all of the, the different features of senescent cells. So an excellent grad student, Hannah Walters, who's now got a Humboldt Fellowship in, in Germany, um, did some studies looking at different types of mTOR inhibitors. And first of all, we used a first generation drug called rapamycin and found that this actually could alter 
back to a younger um, appearance, normal human skin fibroblasts that were very, very old. And importantly, treatment with rapamycin also delayed the point at which these cells hit senescence. So here's the senescence barrier, untreated and treated cells. We then started looking at a second generation mTOR inhibitor, uh, very similar to the drug that one of the drugs that Joan's going to be talking about. And what we found with this was even more remarkable that we took cells back from really, really old to really, really young. And this is just with seven days treatment. And moreover, if we continuously cultured the cells with this drug, they carried on proliferating and proliferating. They didn't hit the senescence barrier, but remarkably, none of them ever showed any signs of becoming cancerous or undergoing um, neoplastic change. So that's quite promising that we've got a drug that, in essence, can rejuvenate cells. We're not alone in looking at mTOR inhibitors. Um, mTOR has been a very important aging target for a long time. Um, Harrison et al. reported in Nature in 2009 now that um, feeding rapamycin to mice increased their lifespan and other labs um, looked at health and showed there was improvement. And then more recently, Matt Kabeline is running a big project in dogs showing that rapamycin can increase heart health in dogs. And uh, just last year, a study was published looking at putting rapamycin into a hand cream. And of course, this is going to be something that a lot of people get very excited about because they're more concerned about the superficiality of aging rather than the deep tissue stuff until obviously they get very sick. But this study was very exciting in that it showed that um, here are senescent cells in, in normally aged skin. Treatment with rapamycin led to a massive decrease in the number of senescent cells. But not only that, the very disorganized skin structure that you see on aging uh, became reorganized and much better structured. And then the collagen that normally gets destroyed by senescent cells was present as, as a really nice, strong, elastic form. And you can see better health with rapamycin, even in diseases of aging, such as Alzheimer's. Now, this is an exaggerated model in mice where the brains are absolutely chocker with amyloid, um, shown by this brown pigment. Um, but Arlen Richardson has shown that treating with rapamycin actually reduces these amyloid deposits really quite markedly. And um, they see improved blood flow to the brain, suggesting better brain function, which they also confirmed using um, cognitive studies, looking at the way mice could navigate around a maze. And so these Alzheimer's mice were pretty rubbish. They, they forgot where they were all the time. But when they were treated with rapamycin, they regained their memory. Um, as they were essentially as good as mice that didn't have Alzheimer's. And then, of course, Joan later on is going to talk about how mTOR inhibitors can support the elderly immune system. So a group of us have got together. I think you might see some familiar names here. So we've got Janet and we've got Joan on this paper. We're looking at how we can use this understanding from aging science to actually bring safe, well, um, well-tolerated drugs that are cheap and widely available into the clinic to improve the health of older people. So as I said, Jane's going to talk about mTOR inhibitors. There's a commonly used diabetic drug called metformin, which is showing extreme promise. And even in COVID now, it looks to improve um, outcomes, particularly for women with either diabetes or who are um, obese. And then statins, a very, very widely used drug, very well tolerated. And um, Liz Sapi, another co-author on, on our um, Lancet review, has shown that treatment with statins when older people go into hospital with pneumonia improves their outcomes even six months down the line. So much, much better survival from pneumonia and obviously all the consequences of that in older people treated with statins. And there's a paper now from China looking at um, giving statins to uh, COVID patients, showing a really quite significant decrease in death rates uh, between patients treated with statins and those um, without statins in the control group. So um, a lot of these drugs are looking very, very promising for COVID, um, increasing survival. But even in patients who do survive, a large number of them appear to have long COVID or consequences of viral infection. And particularly uh, lung fibrosis might be a problem for the long term. And this is where other drugs, those senolytic drugs that kill senescent cells might come in useful because they've already been shown to help resolve lung fibrosis.
Okay, and um, so finally, it remains for me to thank all the um, people who funded this work over the years. Um, and a particular shout out, obviously, to UK Spine, and then to Jim Mellon, who has very generously donated money to set up a longevity science programme in Oxford. And then the people in my lab, um, so past and present, who are doing the work um, that I've been talking about. So thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry about the glitch in the middle, but it's digital, hey, we all have to live with that stuff. <laughs> okay, and now I'm going to hand directly over to Janet, if I can get rid of this particular screen, who is going to pick up the baton on immune ageing. Janet, over to you. Thank you, Elaine. Let's get my screen up as well. Come on, you know you want to do it. Okay. Great, so, so Lynn's already introduced some of the concepts I'm going to go through uh, in a little bit more detail, thinking about um, coronavirus and the disease that it causes, COVID-19, and how ageing may impact um, on our response. So if we think about your immune system, what I'm going to do is try and persuade you that it does age. And you think of its normal job, it has to detect and kill pathogens, so they can be a bacteria or a virus. It has to improve its response when you meet that particular pathogen again, and that's what we call immune memory. And this is the basis by which vaccinations work. It also has to kill and remove damaged senescent or transformed cells. Those are precancerous cells. And it must do this without damaging our cells. So today, of course, we're focusing on infection and coronavirus. <coughs> So um, here's some data from back in 2005 from uh, a colleague at Birmingham, Doug Fleming. Um, and this really demonstrates what happens to our uh, immune systems with age. So I'll walk you through this slowly. So these vertical bars are when there's a flu epidemic. The green line is the numbers of people going to their GPs with a chest infection. The blue line is they're sick enough to go to hospital and the yellow line is death. And you can see that if you're 45 to 64 years old, the incidence is about 900 per 100,000 at the peaks of the epidemics. But in this age group, you're highly unlikely to end up in hospital or to pass away. If we go to the older group, 65 to 74 years old, now we've got a higher instance. We've got uh, up to 1,100 per 100,000. So these older adults are more susceptible to the virus. And now there's about a 10 to 20% chance they might be sick enough that they end up in hospital, but still they're unlikely to die in this age group. When we get to the over 75 year olds, then we see an even worsening picture. We've now got an incidence of almost 1,400 per 100,000. And now there's about a 50% chance the patient will be ill enough to go to hospital and about a one in three chance that they'll pass away. So you're more susceptible to infection. So your immune system really isn't uh, protecting you. And when you get those infections, you're frailer, you're sicker as a result. And so again, this idea of, of, of really not protecting you. And Lynn's already shown you some of these dates. She managed to get something even more, more update that I, I got 16th of October. But uh, the older adult, I think you can see very clearly, just as for those um, flu data, for COVID, it's just the same. Over 90% of the deaths are actually in the over 75 year olds. So more susceptible and um, sicker as a result. So what's going on then? Again, Lynn's been very good and introduced you some of the basic concepts. So coronavirus, like any other virus, um, they enter specific cells and they do this because they have to uh, bind to a specific receptor, a protein on the surface that allows them entry to the cell, a little bit like a lock and a key. And for coronavirus, like um, uh, all respiratory viruses, the, the cells it binds to are our airway cells, particular the alveolar epithelial cells and also the upper airway. And the receptor they bind to is called ACE2. And the uh, virus then gets in through our mouth and our nose. And if it actually stays in the upper airways, then the symptoms are milder. When the problems are occur is when the virus manages to get into our lungs itself and gets into these alveolar epithelial cells. And that's where we've got a much higher chance of getting the severe symptoms of COVID-19. So what happens is the uh, virus gets into the cell. It's also uh, the viral fragments are detected by cells called dendritic cells. 
they then release um, factors, particularly this uh, 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 immune hormone type one interferon, which then activates other cells of the immune system to help deal with the virus. And as, as Lynn said, we have these innate cells. So you have monocytes, macrophages that are there in the lungs all the time and also some neutrophils. They will respond immediately. They will give this inflammatory response and they bring then more cells into the site. So you get a generalized inflammation. Eventually, and this can take five to seven days, your, the, the clever part of the immune system, the adaptive immune system here, the T cells will come into play. So you have T cells, CD8s will actually kill the virus infected cells and others, the CD4s that actually help another type of cell called a B cell. And it's the B cell that makes antibody that can then eventually block the virus from getting into the cell in the first place. So you have the early ones that cause the inflammation, really get the whole thing going, and then the cells coming in and, and clearing away the infection. But unfortunately, this can go really wrong. So what can happen is that this inflammation is really not controlled. It goes over the top, and you may have heard of cytokine storm. And so this inflammation can also damage our tissues. So it can damage the blood vessels uh, around the lungs area, giving some of the cardiovascular complications. Um, it can damage the, the lung cells itself um, and leading to pneumonia. So really this process is finely balanced. And if you don't get it right, then you end up with serious COVID-19. So what happens with the older adult? Why are they more susceptible? Well, several reasons. First of all, those physical barriers that Lynn talked about are affected with aging. So due to um, loss of muscle uh, in the lung area and everywhere else in the body, you have a reduced ability to give a really good cough um, and get rid of some of the mucus that may contain the virus. Uh, the mucus itself is denser in an older adult, so again, harder to get rid of. So it's much more easy for them to develop a pneumonia. And of course, as Lynn has said, we also um, have a defective immune system. And I'm going to take you through um, a particular cell, the neutrophil. Um, so this um, is one of the, uh, there, there are some resident neutrophils in your lungs, but they will come in uh, significantly when you've got an infection in there. And whilst they don't uh, have a major role in controlling the virus, they can help along the way. We know that they help to prime those dendritic cells and they have a few other functions that they can carry out. Uh, but they will always be brought in an inflammatory response. And unfortunately, this in the case of COVID-19 is not generally very helpful. But here's what they do. So um, if you imagine they've got to get from the blood to the um, site of the infection, and they do this by migrating through the tissues. And this is an analysis we've uh, performed to try to understand why your immune system doesn't work as well as you age. So we took neutrophils from young people and old people and we looked at their migration. And at the top of the screen here, this is where the attractant is that brings them into the site of infection. And what we do is we map them. We can look at the way they move. We can see how fast they move. We can see, do they go in the right direction to try and find out if this is what the problem is with, with infections as we get older. Do your neutrophils just not get there very well? So this is the young people whose neutrophils move beautifully. This is the older person. And I don't think you need to be a professor of immunology to see that there's a problem. So they're supposed to be moving up here to the top of the screen, but they're going sideways. This one's even going backwards. They uh, wiggle around a lot. And I always say it looks like they've lost their sat nav. And this can be a major problem if you've got uh, a pathogen that's uh, reproducing very quickly. And what we've done here is we've taken neutrophils from um, young and old donors and, and, and expose them to the sputum of a patient with pneumonia. So this is a really complex mixture from an infected person. And even in that situation, the older neutrophil just doesn't move as well. And you might think, well, if there's any immunologist listening, well, that's a healthy older adult that you've exposed. Um, what about at times of infection? We know your immune system always functions better when there's an infection. So this is a study I did with uh, my colleague, Liz Sapi, and these are young people here. This is a healthy young person's neutrophils moving. This is a lower respiratory tract infection. So think of this as increasing severity of infection. This is uh, pneumonia and this is sepsis. And you can see that for the young person, sure enough, when they have infections, their neutrophils move quicker. 
except for sepsis, which is such an extreme situation that even the young person's neutrophils don't function well. But look at the older donors. These really don't function well. And in fact, they're worse during an infection. So they don't improve their function during infection. And it's not just neutrophils. These are data from uh, Monica de la Fuente and she's looked at macrophages and they're the same. So whether you're a neutrophil or a macrophage or even a lymphocyte, um, they don't migrate as well as you get older. But why does this matter? Well, we think it's really quite significant because those uh, cells, when they're uh, the neutrophils and the monocytes are moving from the blood to the tissue. This is a neutrophil here and these are blood vessels. What they do is they move by releasing proteases at their leading edge. And so they cause tissue damage along the way. And so we hypothesize that the older neutrophil will actually cause more damage cause more inflammation. And this could be why our older adults are sicker when they get any sort of infection. And here we have, we measured a, a marker of damage um, in the blood here. This is a peptide released when fibrinogen is, is degraded by neutrophil proteases. And sure enough, when we compared young and old, there, uh, there was much more of the damage in the older person. And importantly, this correlated with an increased systemic inflammation. So this increased damage is associated with more inflammation. But we had to find out why. So this is the uh, signaling pathway that is involved in uh, the migrational control of a neutrophil. So we hypothesize that this element, PI3 kinase, probably wasn't getting activated in the older uh, adult. And we were proved uh, partially right. So here's a young person. This is um, a Western blot. So essentially, the darker this line is, the more active that PI3 kinase is. And this is a young person responding to CXCL8. And you can see we get a, a very nice activation. But in the older person, we don't get an increased activation. But hopefully you've spotted what the main difference is, is that these freshly isolated neutrophils that we haven't activated with anything are already active. So this PI3 kinase was constitutively active. So we wondered, well, if we inhibit, would they move better? And sure enough, they did. If we inhibited uh, the PI3 kinase, particularly this delta isoenzyme, then they moved better. Could we bring this into clinical practice? Well, no, those inhibitors are way too powerful. They're used in chemotherapy trials. And so we had to find an alternative solution. And so we went downstream. We thought, what if we inhibit this component here called a GTPase? Uh, and we knew how we could do this was by using statins. So statins, as well as reducing cholesterol uh, in your blood, they also reduce uh, these compounds here, which are tagged on to GTPase, it's called protein prenylation. And if they don't have that protein prenyl groups, then they can't be activated. So would statins help? Well, yes, they would. Um, so here's a, an older person's neutrophils and a young person's neutrophils uh, treated with uh, statins and it improves it and it's concentration dependent. This is in vitro, does it work in vivo? And this is the study that uh, Lynn's already introduced you to. We took patients with uh, pneumonia and we gave them statins for seven days or a placebo. And we then monitored their neutrophil functions and also looked at things like survival. And what we found was their um, health was improved. Um, so this, uh, this, this is an organ damage score. So while they were in hospital, the ones that had the statin had less organ damage. And remarkably, they had much better survival. This is the placebo and this is the uh, statin group. And as Lynn uh, has already introduced, this study came out just a few months ago, um, comparing survival, 28-day uh, survival on patients who were on statins already on non-statin users. Um, and sure enough, we had improved uh, less death in the statin users. And interestingly, again, fitting our theory, what happens was the statin users had much lo lower levels of inflammation than the non-statin users. So it looks like um, this is happening in COVID as well. What about the other aspects of immune aging? I've told you that uh, uh, the part of the immune system is to provide immune memory, and we know that vaccine responses are in reduced with aging. 
So above the line here, this is tetanus, but it's the same for pretty well any vaccination. Above the line, you've got enough antibody to be protected and below you haven't. And essentially, if you're 70 years and older, there's a much lower chance that you'll respond to a vaccination. Why is this? Well, if we think about the adaptive immune system, you have T cells produced in the thymus. They, when they meet their antigen, proliferate like crazy, control the infection, and then uh, produce your memory. But with aging, unfortunately, the, the thymus shrinks that produces the T cells. So you have less of these T cells around. And even the ones you've got um, uh, have shorter telomeres. Um, Lynn's introduced you to this, so they're closer to senescence. They don't proliferate as well. So I'm now going to hand over to um, Joan Manick uh, to uh, take you through about what we can actually do about this to tackle immune senescence and help patients hopefully fight COVID a lot better. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Janet. So Janet introduced this fact that a person's age is the strongest predictor of their risk of dying from COVID-19. And as Janet mentioned, what this is highlighting is dysfunction of the aging immune system. And I think it's been assumed there isn't much we can do about the fact that as we get older, our organ systems like our immune system fail and we get sick. But what's interesting is there's increasing preclinical data that this just isn't the correct assumption and we actually can do something about why our organ systems are aging and make it better. And that includes why our immune system is aging. And this is an area of medicine that drug developers have ignored to date. And it's exciting because I think the COVID-19 pandemic is highlighting the importance of this area of medicine. So it turns out there's a variety of biologic mechanisms that have been identified that contribute to why we age. Lynn mentioned senescence, and I'm gonna focus on the activity of a protein called mTOR. But what's interesting is all these different mechanisms are just biology that can be targeted by medicines and improve the way we age. So I'm gonna to focus today on studies we've done looking at whether therapies that inhibit the activity of this protein improve immune function and decrease the incidence of respiratory tract infections in older adults. So we started this study, this program in humans, based on a, pro, a study that had been done in old mice. And when these old mice were given six weeks of a drug that inhibits this protein called mTOR, they were found to have rejuvenated hematopoietic stem cell function. So hematopoietic stem cells are the stem cells that produce the immune cells in the body. And they were also found to have a better response to a flu vaccination. What was also interesting is even though these mice were already old, they're probably the equivalent of an 80 year old human. And even though they just got this short course of an mTOR inhibitor, they had increased lifespan, suggesting there was sort of broad health health benefits of this short course of a drug targeting aging biology. And this has been reproduced by other groups. So based on that study, we did a first study to see if this translated to older adults. And we took older adults and exposed them to six or gave them six weeks of an mTOR inhibitor. And as an assessment of their immune function, we just said, can they respond better to an influenza vaccination? So that study was published in 2014. And what we showed was that yes, the mTOR inhibitor, people who got mTOR inhibitors responded better to a flu vaccination than people who did it. Now I should say we used very low doses or intermittent dosing of these mTOR inhibitors, which is not how they're usually used. And these low doses and intermittent doses were well tolerated in these older adults. What was interesting in that study is we also noted that the people who got mTOR inhibitors were reporting having fewer respiratory tract infections. And these had nothing to do with the flu vaccination. They weren't influenza respiratory tract infections. There were just all kinds of respiratory tract infections. So this gave us a hint that maybe their improvement in immune function was beyond just responding better to a flu vaccine. 
they also may be responding better to infectious pathogens. So based on that result, we did a second phase two study, and we again gave people six weeks of an mTOR inhibitor, but this time we used two different kinds of mTOR inhibitors to see if both, different, both kinds of mTOR inhibitors alone or together had benefit. And we again looked at influenza vaccination response, but this time also looked at infection rates and particularly respiratory tract infections because even before COVID-19, respiratory tract infections were the most common infections in older adults. And we also looked at what genes were changed in expression in whole blood in people who got mTOR inhibitors. So what we found is again, there was a dose-dependent improvement in influenza vaccination response in these older adults. They, there was also a dose-dependent decrease in infection rates, and in particular, respiratory tract infection rates. And of interest, some of the only genes that were upregulated in people who got mTOR inhibitors as compared to people who got placebo were genes involved in fighting viral infections. And this was interesting because, again, even before COVID-19, most respiratory tract infections in older adults, including pneumonia, turned out to be caused by viruses. So it was possible that this upregulation of antiviral genes that we were seeing was the reason why people were having fewer respiratory tract infections. So based on that, we went on to do a phase 2B study, and this time we extended dosing to 16 weeks to cover winter cold and flu season, because as you will remember from a slide that Janet showed, there are peaks of hospitalization and deaths every winter in people 65 and particularly 75 above when respiratory viruses are circulating in the community. So we looked, if we treat people for 16 weeks during winter cold and flu season, do they have fewer respiratory tract infections? And again, is this due to the fact that they're having improved antiviral responses? So in that study, we did see a dose-dependent decrease in respiratory tract infections in older adults during winter cold and flu season. And we saw again that their antiviral gene expression was upregulated, suggesting this may be the mechanism. So this was encouraging because in all these trials, we were seeing evidence that mTOR inhibition in older adults targeting this fundamental pathway that contributes to why we age seemed to be improving the function of the aging immune system. We then went on to do a phase three trial to confirm these results, and unfortunately, the phase three trial was negative. So the question is, what happened in this phase three trial, and why didn't it reproduce these previous findings? So one of the problems with the phase three trial is we were asked by the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. that has to approve the pivotal endpoint and trial design for, for uh, drug trials, they asked us to change the primary endpoint and patient population between our phase 2B and phase 3 trials. And anytime you change, change a trial design, you're at risk for not being able to repeat the results. So the phase 2B trial enrolled five different patient populations that were at high risk of getting sick from having respiratory tract infections. So those are people 85 and above, 65 and above with asthma, diabetes, COPD, or current smokers. We chose these high-risk population because insurers said, if you want us to cover your medications with insurance, you have to show us that you can decrease respiratory tract infections in people at high risk of getting hospitalized from respiratory tract infections because that is costing the healthcare system a lot of money. And in this trial, the, the endpoint was, that was chosen by the FDA was laboratory-confirmed respiratory tract infections. So everyone had to meet certain symptomatic criteria to be diagnosed with a respiratory tract infection, and they had to have a nasopharyngeal swab in which a respiratory pathogen was identified in order to have this lab-confirmed respiratory tract infection diagnosed. In that trial, we found that all the high-risk patient populations had a decrease in respiratory tract infections, except people with chronic obstruction, obstructive pulmonary disease, which are mainly smokers and current smokers. So this decreased efficacy in these two groups may be due to the fact that when you inhibit this protein called mTOR, at least in mice, it exacerbates cigarette smoke-induced inflammation. 
So when we went on to do the phase three trial, the FDA said, you know what, don't enroll all these people, pe people with comorbidities, enroll just everyone who's 65 and older who doesn't smoke or have COPD. And we want you to change the primary endpoint to something called clinically symptomatic respiratory illness. So what is this? This was something they defined as symptoms consistent with a respiratory tract in infection, irrespective of whether we could actually show by nasopharyngeal swab that infection was causing the symptoms. The reason the FDA changed the recommendations, and they admitted to us this was in a new area for them, they never had to approve a drug that improved immune function in older adults, so they needed to learn. But they thought what is most important to older adults is how they feel and function. And their symptoms are relative to how, respiratory symptoms are relevant to how they feel and function, but whether or not they have a positive nasopharyngeal swab isn't relevant to how they feel and function. So we had to have an endpoint that was just based on symptoms. Well, it turns out when this was brought into a clinical trial, older adults have all sorts of respiratory symptoms, even when they know they aren't sick. And so part of the problem with this phase three trial was this was too noisy an endpoint. And so I think it still remains to be determined, does upregulation of these antiviral genes by mTOR inhibitor have clinical benefit? And we have to refine that endpoint. But we've learned a lot from these trials, and these have been done in almost 2,000 older adults now. So what have we learned? First of all, we've learned, and this has been really important, that low doses of mTOR inhibitors, particularly one called RTB101, which we used most, are well tolerated in older, sub, older adults. This is really important because there was a fear when we started this program that if we target the fundamental pathways that are contributed to why we age, it might not be safe in older adults. But at, the, at least these mTOR inhibitors are low do, at low doses have been very well tolerated. We have not been able to find any adverse events that occur more frequently in people getting low doses of RTB than people getting placebo. The most concerning adverse events are those moderate or severe or serious. And you can see there isn't any consistent difference between the percentage of people that get with these more concerning adverse events in the RTB-101 treatment group versus placebo in both trials. The other really important thing we learned was that if you inhibit this aging biology, mTOR inhibition, you consistently upregulate antiviral responses in older adults. So this is, we looked at the expression of 20 different genes that play in a really important role in our fighting viral infections and looked at their change in expression over 16 weeks of treatment in the placebo group versus the RTB 101 treatment group in both the phase 2B and phase 3 trial. And you can see there were significantly more genes that were upregulated in the people who got RTB 101 than the people who got placebo. So what are these interferon genes and what does interferon do? And Janet mentioned this. So when you are, your cells are infected with a virus such as coronavirus, the virus is recognized by things called pattern recognition receptors in cells and induce the production of this critical set of molecules called type 1 interferons. These then go and to other cells and bind interferon receptors induce the expression of hundreds of different antiviral genes. So what do these antiviral genes do? Well, this is a typical replicative cycle of a virus called like coronavirus. And you can see it's complex. There are many steps involved in a virus replicating inside cells. Each of these genes indicated by the red stars are the genes that are upregulated by type one interferons. And you can see they stop many different steps in the replicative cycle of all sorts of different viruses. So these are the first, interferons are the first line of defense that we have against viral infections. And the genes that are upregulated by the older adults who got mTOR inhibitors are shown with the green rectangles. This upregulation of interferon responses may be particularly important for older adults because older adults have defective response, interferon responses to viruses. And this has been shown by multiple groups. In this study on the left, males and females who are 20 to 35 years old 
or males and females over 50 years old had whole blood collected that was exposed to herpes simplex virus. And you can see the blood of the younger adults produced significantly more inter type 1 interferon than the blood of older adults. And similarly, in the study on the right, monocytes were obtained from younger adults who are 20 to 33 years old or older adults who are 65 to 89 years old. And the monocytes from the younger adults produce significantly more interferon when infected with influenza than the monocytes from older adults. This deficiency in interferon production in response to virus infection may be one of the reasons why COVID-19 is more severe in older adults because type 1 interferon seems to be particularly important for fighting COVID-19. So this was a study published in Cell this year looking at interferon levels in blood or interferon-induced gene expression in blood cells in people who had mild to moderate COVID-19 in blue or severe or critical COVID-19 in purple or red. And you can see interferon levels are lower and interferon-induced gene expression is significantly lower in the people who have more severe disease than the people who have mild or moderate disease. And this importance of having enough interferon to fight COVID-19 is further highlighted by two recent papers that came out in Science showing that a significant percentage of patients with life-threatening COVID-19 pneumonia either have genetic mutations in the type 1 interferon pathway or neutralizing autoantibodies that stop type 1 interferon from, be from being able to function. So this raises the question, would mTOR inhibitors like RTB101 have benefit in COVID-19 by upregulating these interferon responses and improving the function of the aging immune system? Well, we don't know the answer to this because when we did our clinical trials, COVID-19 was not circulating, or SARS-CoV-2, but other coronaviruses were circulating. So in both the phase 2B and phase 3 trials, we looked at the specific pathogens that were causing the lab-confirmed respiratory tract infections. And we looked at the number of respiratory tract infections caused by each pathogen in the RTB101 treatment arm in blue and in the placebo treatment arm in gray. And just focusing down on coronaviruses, there were fewer coronavirus infections in older adults given RTB in both the phase 2B and 3 trial, although numbers are too low to assess statistical significance. What we really care about, though, are the severe respiratory tract infections and preventing those. So looking at the number of people who had severe respiratory tract infections, again, the people who got RTB had fewer severe coronavirus infections than people who got placebo in both the phase 2B and phase 3 trial. And again, these were in almost 2,000 people. What was also interesting, there were other viruses where we saw a decrease in the number of severe infections, including rhinovirus infections, which are actually, before COVID-19, the most common cause of pneumonia, getting people hospitalized who are 80 and above, and also influenza virus, much fewer influ severe influenza virus infections. So there may be virus-specific effects of this upregulation of antiviral gene expression because there were other viral infections like parainfluenza and respiratory syncytial virus infection where we didn't see consistent benefit. But since we did see some consistent signals with coronavirus infections, we're now doing two clinical trials of RTB101 to see if we can prevent or decrease the severity of COVID-19 infections. The first is being done um, of prophylaxis with RTB to decrease the severity of COVID-19 in residents of nursing homes, which are care homes, with COVID-19 outbreaks. And the second is a small pilot study funded by the National Institutes of Aging in the U.S. of people 65 and older who are household contacts of someone with COVID-19 or, or who are asymptomatic and SARS-CoV-2 positive. So in summary, I think dysfunction of the aging immune system is an area of medicine that has been mostly ignored by drug developers, but whose importance is highlighted by this COVID-19 pandemic. And RTB101 provides a feasibility of safely targeting aging biology to improve at least aspects of immune dysfunction in older adults, in this case, deficient type 1 interferon-induced antiviral response. We have to work with payers and regulatory authorities to determine ex what are the right clinical trial endpoints for, with, for drugs that improve immune function and what's the right patient population.
And we are currently doing trials of RTB as COVID-19 prophylaxis in older adults. And that's it. Thank you, that's great. I think Bev is going to field some questions now for us all. I am indeed. So we'll take as many as we can and others will circulate over the email and get responses to if we run out of time. So uh, question number two um, from iPad DGH, if, uh, if they'd like to switch their camera on, they're welcome to. is a question that says, I'd like to ask Lynn around rapamycin, whether telomere shortening still occurs and whether they have any indication as to the effects of this. So Lynn. Okay, well, we've got some very preliminary unpublished data on this. Um, the acute treatment does not regrow telomeres. So if you're just doing seven days of treatment with a drug that changes morphology, your telomeres are still short. So it, it's not going to suddenly make cells completely rejuvenated. But what it does seem to do, if you use intermittent dosing, as Jen was talking about, or, or long-term dosing at very low concentrations, you seem to have a much slower rate of telomere attrition. So the cells are actually aging more slowly in, in biological terms. Um, we'd quite like to do the aging clocks on that. We haven't done it yet, but um, it's still quite early days with the telomere data. But that's an incredibly good question. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. So on to question number two, um, which is from Graham Wilkinson. Um, if Graham, if you're still with us, if you wanted to turn your camera on, ask the question. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Bev. Uh, just, just really interested in the kind of the mechanisms of action of the, of the various inhibitors that have been used and just kind of wondering whether there's any kind of convergence on a common mechanism there. Um, or are they parallel, you know, acting in parallel, the opportunity for additivity in these effects? Mm. It's a good question, Graham. So I, I think I saw it in the chat line as well. So yeah, statins, I, I think from my point of view, have a major role in dropping the inflammation side of things. So, you know, the unintended damage. And certainly through their regulation of GTPAs, as we know, you know, pretty well all the chemokines use the, those uh, compounds. They're important in movement. So I, I, for me, I think, um, you know, the mTOR inhibitors are, are acting through a different pathway, um, but, but certainly the statins are going to be majorly influential on the immune system. We know that they modify T cell function as well. Um, so so I, I think there's differences there in additivity. So I don't know what uh, Joan and, and Lynn might think. Can I pop in on that? Um, we've actually looked at mTOR inhibitors in terms of inflammation. So we've been using IL-6 as a readout from senescent cells. And um, the most effective mTOR inhibitors in terms of turning back the morphological clock are also the ones that are most potent at dumping down IL-6 production. So they do appear to have anti-inflammatory action and, and various other labs as well have shown this. So um, Hazus Gill's lab um, and Judy Campese's lab have both looked at the impact of mTOR inhibition on inflammation and shown that it's signaling through the IL-1A pathway. Mm. Uh, so we, we will be getting decreased inflammation with the rapalogs as well as with the statins. Mm. And one further point on that, mTORC2, so there's different flavors of mTOR. So mTORC2 complex signals predominantly to cytoskeletal elements and it goes through. CDC 42 mm -hmm. and Rho. Mm -hmm. So it, there may be some convergence on what Janet has been showing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they're just complex interlinked systems that we're not looking at a drug that impacts mm -hmm. one kinase and that's all it does. That kinase regulates a whole pile of other signaling pathways and so you will have these knock-on effects. Joan, mm -hmm. do you want to come in there? Yeah, I think there's also the theory that each all of these aging mechanisms are interrelated so you push on one and it benefits the others. So it's sort of a interconnected web. Great, thank you all very much. Great thank talk you. as well. <laughs> thank you, Graham and all. I noticed that we are at the top of the hour and I realized that people uh, will have other things in their calendars. So I think we will circulate the other questions of which we have some fabulous questions to the speakers. Um, and put the responses out on our website once the conference is complete.
So it just leaves me now to say a huge thank you to Janet, Lynn and Joan for giving up their time this afternoon and being part of the UK Spine Conference. And to all of you who are, are still here and have been here during the session, thank you very much for joining us. So feel free to join your camera on and, and, and clap as you say goodbye. And uh, I'm sure I'll hopefully see many of you later on in the week for our final session on Friday. Thank you very much.